What's your favourite PS1 game that nobody else remembers? The OG PS1 has such a vast, vast library of games that there are still underrated whippers that are only just being discovered today, and we all played different games when we were young. Hey, some of us may actually think that Moses Prince of Egypt is something of a hidden gem, and not the digital anthrax that it actually is. The PS2 may have eclipsed its older brother in terms of sales, but there's no reason to consider the original Sony console as somehow less deserving of your love. The PS1 was truly instrumental in catapulting games into the mainstream public arena, helping to take the industry away from the realm of the arcade and firmly into the domestic sphere. From Silent Hill to Gran Turismo and the often forgotten Silent Gran, the PS1 was the birthplace of many iconic series, but there are plenty of games that never quite got their due. At a time of experimentation and innovation, a few gems have inevitably fallen through the cracks and become a little bit lost to time. We hope we can do our part just a little bit to help these underrated bangers on the original PS1 to be found and enjoyed once again. Crack open a fresh Tomb Raider memory card with the boys, and let us travel to the Camden market of our memories to come up with the PS1's weird, wonderful, and weirdly forgotten gems. Let us know what your favourite hidden gem is on the PS1, and you could win a free Steam key! That's cool! Right, we're not going to say anything, and we're going to see if you can use some kind of force of some kind to guess the first game we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Did you get it? Lots of games during the PS1 era had force in the title, but few were as underrated or underappreciated as novel 90s fighting sim Psychic Force. Originally an arcade game, Psychic Force was ported to the PlayStation in 1997, a transfer that did little to diminish the charm of Taito's ambitious, if kind of flawed, take on one of the 90s' most popular genres. Instead of the standard underground fight clubs and pristine dojos that usually made pleasing backdrops to two burly men kicking one another in the head while shouting incomprehensible catchphrases, Psychic Force's action is framed by a cube-shaped magical force field. I hate when I enter cube-shaped magical force fields on the way to the shops. What set the game apart was that fights occurred not only from left to right but also up and down as players floated up, down and across the screen and proceedings tended to look like a brawl had broken out out inside an indoor skydiving facility. It isn't the perfect game, hampered occasionally by a lack of proper depth and some pretty dreadful C-tier anime-ass dialogue. Great power is a double-edged sword. You must not be allowed to use that power. Don't stand in my way. I have an important job to do. But what Psychic Force does have is charm and novelty. It's fun twist on the format bringing something new to a genre that hasn't been seen much this side of something called Dragon Ball, or whatever that is. Hey kids, want some drugs? Okay, I don't have any drugs, but how about a weird PS1 game instead? The drugs are all for me. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words, unless it's generated by AI, in which case it's worthless. So, following that logic, LSD Dream Emulator is like stitching together War and Peace, Moby Dick, the Iliad, and that one overly verbose speech from the old guy in the second Matrix film. It's a lot to take in visually, is what we're trying to say. It is supposed to be a dream emulator though, and we've all had those dreams where you wake up thinking, what the hell was that? I don't need to do my maths GCSE, I'm 32 years old. So imagine an entire disc of levels like that, and you're about there. Usually I would rather die than do my maths GCSE again. You can't make me. I'll die. I will, I will do something drastic. There's no real goal or objective to complete here. You're literally exploring bite-sized dreams that are about 10 minutes in length, in which you can stumble upon anything from dancing rabbits to a live sumo match. Uh, originally, this bonkers and highly innovative title was only available in Japan. But in the past few years, dedicated modders and fans have released an English translated version which is available via emulation. Shh, 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 shh. we didn't say anything. We're not necessarily promoting emulation here guys, but the clue is quite literally in the game's name. 
This game is simply too weird and unique not to play through or experience at least once in your life. We're also not necessarily promoting LSD either, as standing up too fast is all the rush we personally need now that we're past the age of 30. Hey, remember that guy from The Matrix? Then do you recall the PS2 Matrix games? Well, the dude who made them were a bit of an underrated banger factory. Shiny Entertainment may have built a reputation and ultimately a legacy on profound weirdness and uh, kinda also underrated Matrix games, but they were never a developer to let quirkiness get in the way of quality. Who could forget the Smith Kaiju? Designed by David Perry, the same man who worked on the original Earthworm Jim in 1994, uh. Wild 9 was a sort of 2.5D platform adventure that took many of Shiny Entertainment's offbeat sensibilities and transposed them into an adventure platformer that was as boldly individual as it was punishingly difficult. Following the brilliantly named Wex Major, I love that so much, as he navigates his way through a Wex Major, sorry, as he navigates his way through a strange new galaxy making eccentric friends and forming the game's titular group, Wild 9 was never quite as polished or cohesive as Earthworm Jim or its many sequels, but it's well worth digging out for anyone who can't get enough of the sort of quirky humour that made Jim a household name. Also, being able to use telekinetic powers to whip people onto spikes and use their corpses as bridges is absolutely wild for the PS1. Cartoonish, fun, and with an identity all of its own, Wild 9 is easily one of the most underrated PS1 games ever made. Here's a slightly weird confession though. This game scared the hell out of me when I was young, and I don't know why. And so did this next game, which is no Crash Bandicoot. You don't need us to tell you that the PlayStation was a trailblazer in a lot of ways. Sony's first stab at the console market, the first PlayStation pioneered discs, significantly more so than the Saturn, in a medium still focused on using cartridges. While the DualShock controller has become the blueprint that many console and controller manufacturers have tried to replicate in the years since. One neat feature that's a bit more obscure is how various games use the CD playing function in-game, with the most famous probably being Monster Rancher. You put in a CD, you'd get a weird monster. What's not to love? However, we're putting the focus today on Vib Ribbon, a rhythm action game that actually allowed players to use their own music via CDs, long before you could just make your own custom chart on Clone Hero. After inserting the game's disc, you were given the option to enter your own CD at which point Vib Ribbon would create rhythm action levels and obstacles based on the music being played. The game doesn't look and sound like pretty much anything else on the PlayStation. In a way, it's also one of the first interactive music visualizers, which is pretty dang neat. It's a pretty expensive equalizer these days though, as the game never actually came to the United States. Checkmate, eagle people. Anyone else remember spinning hybrid theory on this bad boy back in the day? It's crazy that culture still continues after this absolute peak. Hey, do you like beat-em-ups? How about beat-em-ups with... gun? Late 90s beat-em-up fighting force debuted at an odd time for the genre as a whole, especially considering core design had kinda made a template for success with Tomb Raider the year prior. Beat'em up games had enjoyed their initial peak in the 80s with franchises such as Streets of Rage and Final Fight cornering this enjoyably hard edged corner of the market. The genre would see a resurgence later on thanks to the likes of Beautiful Joe and God Hand in the 2000s, not to mention the rise of the hack and slash genre as a whole, but in 1999 things weren't looking so rosy thanks to difficulties with the 3D transition. Perhaps that's why Fighting Force and its maligned sequel ended up falling between the cracks at a time when the industry was enjoying something of a massive overhaul. Situated slap bang in the middle of a wave that was enduring a trough rather than happily enjoying a peaking crest, Fighting Force's tale of a brave crew of fighters taking down criminal mastermind by punching everything in sight failed to generate much critical or commercial attention. That 
All being said, the first Fighting Force game is something of a lost cult classic, a satisfying brawler that gives you everything you could want from a beat-em-up game released back in the 90s. It was never exactly revolutionary in terms of its characters, plot, or setup, or, well, pretty much anything, but for being one of the first brawlers to really translate the action from 2D to 3D, Fighting Force deserves more attention than it ever actually received. Sure, it plays about as gracefully as an influencer apology video, but goddammit, if straight up shooting people trying to punch you isn't the most fun of all time. Hey, think you've played every 3D fighter on the PS1? Think again. The original PlayStation boasts probably the best library of fighting games in gaming history, not including current platforms anyway. So many classics made their way onto Sony's big grey beautiful box, including Tekken 2 and 3, Marvel vs Capcom, Street Fighter Alpha 3, and that barely covers all of the absolute bangers that you can still play and enjoy on the system to this day. While some of the more underrated games include Battle Arena to Shinden, and uh, guides, God bless the ring, which I absolutely hate saying all of the time, Sobel number one definitely deserved more attention too. A 3D fighter with characters designed by the late great Akira Toriyama, Sobel number one allowed for full freedom of movement during a battle. With a wide range of attacks and even a grappling system for fans of suplexing people all over the shop. There was even a quest mode which expanded the regular gameplay into a 3D dungeon crawler, with players unlocking new characters by defeating them in the mode. Of course, there was no save file for this mode for some curious reason, so you either got good at the opening fights quickly, or quit altogether. While it might sound like a forgotten aftershave promoted by Topher Grace at the height of his fame, Tobal number one's character design by the iconic Akira Toriyama and Virtua Fighter-esque look means it's absolutely worth trying out. Rest in peace, you absolute friggin' legend. Nobody will ever forget what you did with Dragon Ball. Now let's talk about furries before I start to cry. Get ready, fight! Let me just start this section off by simply saying, off the rip, bring back Bloody Raw. The market has always been one brimming with competition. The fighting game niche has for a long while been mainly sewn up by a couple of major properties, most of which debuted when you still had to go to an arcade and part with your hard earned quarters if you wanted a safe place to roundhouse your best mate using a character with the head of a leopard. Fighting games never change. Tekken, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat. These are the names that have become household, around forever and certainly not going anywhere anytime soon. It's little wonder then that with such heavyweights dominating the arena that there wasn't much room left in the ring for a new contender looking to become a champion. Punching! What Bloody Raw did have on its side was the novelty factor, building itself around the concept of having a group of fighters capable of transforming into a variety of animals in combat. Kinda like Animorphs, but not completely cursed. Coupled with polished, pretty punchy gameplay and enticing design, Bloody Raw managed to just about hold its own, going on to spawn three sequels, including another one on the PlayStation 1, up until 2003. That's more than 20 years ago. Sadly, however, it could never quite muscle in on the big boys' racket. Now only remembered as one of the most underrated PS1 fighting games you've likely never played. If they released Bloody Raw today, there would absolutely be a market for it. I mean, a very specific market, but a pretty dedicated market all the same. Are you in the market for an underrated banger of a turn-based RPG? It must have been ridiculous to have been an RPG development team working on a PS1 release, as it's a console library that boasts a real killer row of RPG Hall of Fame picks. 
Final Fantasy 7, 8, 9, Vagrant Story, Suikoden 2, Wild Arms, Parasite Eve. Those games alone are barely scratching the surface of the excellent RPGs on the platform, so it's no wonder that games like Legend of Lagaya managed to fall through the cracks. That's a shame, as Lagaya's approach to combat makes it one of the most unique games on Sony's first platform, as well as a good reminder of the kind of mad swings they used to take as a publisher before they re-released The Last of Us like free times. Set in a world where magical beasts called Sira have been corrupted by a mysterious mist, Legend of Lagaya thrusts you into the shoes of Vaughn, not that one, a hero who's able to summon a special kind of Siru and cleanse the mist. What makes Legend of Lagaya so interesting is its approach to turn-based combat, as instead of picking an action from a menu, you input a series of attack commands to create special sequences called arts, or in Helldivers 2, we call them stratagems. Players can chain these commands together to devastate opponents, creating an experience that's still incredibly unique, and one we're surprised hasn't been copied much since. Legend of Lagaya saw a sequel on PS2, Lagaya 2 Dual Saga, which even few people seem to have played, but we might just feature that on an underrated PS2 games list. Do you want to see that? Let us know down below. You know what we're definitely not getting another game from? This next weird ass survival horror series. Galarians isn't perhaps the most enticing, intriguing or enigmatic title for a game, but you can't help but feel it might have sounded better in its original Japanese form, which I am not going to even attempt to say to maintain diplomatic relations with an entire country. Joe, put it on the screen please mate, thank you. Polygon Magic Survival Horror tells the story of Rico, a boy with psychic powers who awakens to discover that he's the only one capable of halting the advance of the game's eponymous genetically advanced humanoids. Thanks to its clear creative debt to the original Resident Evil games, Galarians does end up suffering from many of the same issues that threaten to undermine the excellence of Capcom's iconic franchise, but without much of that weird, unknowable charm that somehow makes it an absolutely essential piece of video game art. That's right, I'm talking about sandwiches. But in Galarian, some rather wonky cutscenes, cliched storytelling and visual and sound design that could never quite match the tone the game was trying to set really stick out a good bit more. Still, for a game that came out in 1999, Galarians does a pretty good job of telling its oddball story and selling its futuristic nightmare, doing enough to earn pretty solid reviews and even spawn a sequel in the shape of Galarian's Ash for the PS2. That box art, by the way, that's very, very cold. With us currently in the midst of a second golden age of survival horror, who's to say that we couldn't see another Galarians game? Literally everyone? Yeah, fair enough. But do you like animals? Okay, we already established that with the bloody raw entry when you literally started howling. But do you like Skies of Arcadia too? This last game is just for you. A dark horse contender for the PS1 game most eligible for a remake or remaster, Tail Concerto for the PS1 was CyberConnect 2's first attempt at marrying cute animals with mechs in a series referred to as Little Tail Bronx. While it's an idea that the Japanese devs would revisit over the years, as well as the same Naruto game about 19 bloody times, it would take their fourth entry, Fuga Melodies of Steel, for the LTB series to really gain more mainstream attention. Now that Fuga is barreling towards a third game in that subseries, maybe now is the time for Tail Concerto to have another go. Years and years before Paw Patrol, and even more years before Cap'n Turbot committed grand larceny, Tail Concerto lets you play as a canine cop with the remarkably adorable name of Waffle Rybret, no, who comes into conflict with a group of sky pirates known as the Black Cats Gang. And like the RPGs in the Little Tail Bronx series, Tail Concerto is more of a platformer, with players travelling through levels trying to rescue kittens and trying to stop the Black Cats gang from stealing ancient crystals. Low sales in Japan might have stopped Tail Concerto from gaining more notoriety, but it's never too late for a second chance, just like Judy did to Jason Bateman in Zootopia. Am I a friend of the fairies yet? 
If you've been loving the 90s platformer renaissance of the last few years, Tell Concerto is a game worth but oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind that. The solution is just a Google search away, my guys. Hey, have you considered giving us a second chance and watching more videos? We think you will love these videos that are about to pop up on screen now. And don't forget to enter our free giveaway. I've been Jimmy for Cultured Vultures, and thank you for watching.